Well, good morning and welcome back uh, to this course in Introductory Quantum Mechanics for Computational Biologists and Quantitative Biologists. In the last two lectures, we have spent all our time to analyze one specific quantum mechanical problem. That is the particle in a one dimensional square web. And, uh, and we will devote the third lecture to this uh, very system uh, because we want to uh, dig from this exercise additional information. In particular, what we want to do in this lecture is to analyze what happens uh, when you sort of leave the quantum realm regime and you get uh, to physical systems that resemble more and more the properties of a classical system. And of course, we would like to see that quantum mechanics contains in itself uh, the same information as classical mechanics, because that we know that when the system becomes, loosely speaking, macroscopic or has the property that we know in the macroscopic world, then you know, Newton's mechanics is <clears throat> a correct description of nature is being validated for, for hundreds of years, uh, very accurately. So uh, quantum mechanics better gives the same prediction of Newton mechanics when Newton's mechanics is working. So this is the uh, topic that we will cover in this lecture. And in the subsequent part of this lecture, which I call part B of this lecture, we will further analyze what happens when you, rather than looking at a particle in one dimension, we look at a particle in multiple dimensions. So we have multi-dimensional square well. For simplicity, we will restrict ourselves to the two-dimensional square well, but it, of course the generalization to three-dimensional square well would be um, straightforward. And I guess there is no need to go beyond three dimensions uh, for, for this, at least for the sake of this course. Okay, so let me begin by summarizing what are the results that we obtained in the past week. Now we, you know, we, lo we look at the solution of Schrodinger equation and splitting even part to odd part of the solution and we uh, went through a good deal of calculation, but all the results we found can be presented in a compact way in this set of equation. First of all, uh, we will use a notation which we will label for simplicity for presenting everything in a single board. We will label state from one, two, three, and so on. So the ground state will not be denoted with n equal to zero, but rather than to n equal to one. Why? Because formula becomes simpler if you do that way. So the first piece of information is the energy. You can combine all the results for even an odd part of the wave function in a single equation, which is this equation here, that labels how the energy is, um, is, um, is reported uh, uh, for all values of n. And it's convenient to introduce uh, this quantity k that you read here called the wave vector Which has, a, the, which has a dimension of an inverse length. And if you use this concept here, the energy becomes, uh, it takes this very simple expression. And basically wave vectors you see are integer uh, numbers uh, up to a constant pi over L, which is uniform and, and universal for all states. And why is this interesting? Because, you know, if you remember that this is a free particle, then we can identify you know, the, this to be a kinetic energy since there's only kinetic energy if the particle is free inside the box. And so the idea is that H bar Kn plays a role of a momentum Pn. We see because this then becomes Pn squared over two n. So it's like that. The point is that every single state we have in the box has a different integer n, hence a different value of k, hence a different discretized momentum, pn. So everything is well summarized by the idea that momentum is actually quantized inside a box. And this is why the energy is the kinetic energy is quantized. And then for each value of n, 
uh, we worked out the corresponding wave function now including normalization. These are the normalization constants that are determined by assuming that the wave function modulo square from minus L half to L half modulo square integrated from minus LF to LF must have modulus one, which uh, simply amounts to saying the particle has got to be somewhere. Because remember the modulus square of the wave function is the probability of finding the particle in a particular position X. So let me be a little bit more explicit, say, X. So this is the probability of finding the particle at X. And since the particle is somewhere in the box, the constant in front of uh, the sine and cosine can be simply determined by assuming that the probability to find the particle in any of the points inside the box must be equal to 100%, therefore one. Okay, so this is the collection of results. So we have a kinetic energy. We can now identify a momentum, a quantized momentum to the particle inside the box. So unlike in the infinite square, well, in, in, in the plane wave case, where all possible momenta are allowed, hence the spectrum is continued, inside a box, only some momenta are allowed. And these momenta are those characterized by powers, uh, by taking Kn, the wave vectors, and multiplying by h bar. These are the allowed momenta inside the box. And this reflects itself into some specific allowed energies inside the box. So it is instructive to compare this finding with the result of a simple, straightforward classical calculation for the same problem where the particle is actually a classical particle. So let's consider the same problem in classical mechanics for a moment. Now imagine you have a ball here and you know, throw it with a given velocity, V. No matter where you start the particle with velocity V, the kinetic energy of the particle will be the same. And if we assume that the you know, boundaries of the box, as we are assuming they are perfectly reflecting, this is an ideal box, there is no dissipation or anything, then the energy will be conserved after rebounding to the surface. So basically, we are in one, for each value of V, or equivalently, given the mass for each value of P equals M times V, we have a kinetic energy EP plus P squared over 2M. So, you know, we have infinitely many kinetic energies. Any state here, a different kinetic energy, E prime greater than E double prime greater than E. All these values here in red are different possible values of kinetic energy. They are all allowed in the box and they form a continuum spectrum. Well, nothing particularly inspiring here, nothing particularly uh, difficult to grasp. It's just, you know, you can kick the particle with as much initial velocity as you want and that will produce an energy that will depend on the initial velocity and this energy will be conserved. So how does this solution look in phase space? Well, in phase space, remember in phase space, I have to draw the Q's and the P's. First of all, we notice that only position between minus L and half and L half will be allowed in configuration space because the particle is actually is actually confined in the box. So remember, let me draw here my box. And let me say I start from a position, say Q0, my initial position. Maybe it's this position, let me draw it here. This is my Q0 with a certain momentum P, let's say P0. In this case, the, the position, the initial momentum is positive, which means that the particle is moving to the right. So what happens? Well, I start from this point, 
I move to the right until I hit L half. Keeping the velocity constant, therefore keeping the momentum P naught constant. So I'm moving until I reach this point. Then what happens here, that I reflect almost instantaneously my momentum going to minus P naught because I'm coming back. So which means that basically here, I go all the way down here in no time. And I'm beginning to go in the opposite direction, which is basically going at this with a state with negative momentum P naught. Oops. I've traveled, okay, I'm having some problem in drawing things. So this is negative P naught. That means that I'm going backwards until I hit the hole, the wall on the other side. So I'm doing this trajectory until I reach a position minus L half with momentum P naught. At this point, I change my, I change my momentum again because I'm reflecting the particle against the wall, which means that basically I am going all the way here and then going back again. So my trajectory is in phase space for a classic particle. They look like, they look like uh, squares in phase space. And you see, if I start with a different initial velocity, maybe I start with a lower momentum, P naught prime. Well, then I get basically the same shape but with a smaller rectangle. And in principle, I can choose any P naught I want, so I can color all this stripe with rectangles of arbitrarily height. This is coming from the fact that my momentum in the box for a classical particle is completely unrestricted, right? So this is not actually what happens with a classical particle. Uh, when I, with a quantum particle. When I move from this classical description to the quantum description, things really change drastically. First of all, you know, as you see, when I draw it, they change drastically in two respects. The first feature through which they are changed is that not all the momenta are actually allowed. There are only some momenta, Pn, corresponding to Kn times h bar. And remember, Kn is n pi over L times h bar. So given the size L, have that many discrete states. So for instance, I may have, I don't know, P1, let me be, let P1 be this momentum for a classical particle. Of course, I mean, the quantum particle can only have this momenta, but I'm on the classical trajectory now. I'm highlighting only the classical trajectory that have the momentum allowed by the quantum description. Just to let you show, to, to, show, to illustrate what quantization is all about. You know, quantization is telling me that I cannot have all of these trajectories. In principle, momenta can only be some. In fact, at the beginning of the development of quantum mechanics, people were hoping that quantum mechanics could be obtained from classical mechanics by slightly tilting classical mechanics, by introducing maybe one or more of a couple more principles to classical mechanics to account for the fact that only some momenta, some orbits in phase space were allowed. 
So there were some attempts to modify classical mechanics by, by simply uh, and obtain quantum mechanics by simply introducing uh, constraints in the orbits in phase space that you can actually populate. But then, you know, all the experiments that we summarize in the double slit experiments discussion really pointed toward the fact that the notion of trajectory for a quantum mechanical particle is really not appropriate because the quantum mechanical particle uh, doesn't have uh, a well-defined, the, the states in quantum mechanics do not correspond to classical to classical uh, trajectories because you can never basically determine both the position and the momentum of the particle with infinite accuracy. So how does the quantum mechanical problem look like? You have to abandon the phase space description, even though some features can be drawn on a phase space. In this case, we, we drew on the phase space description the fact that only certain momenta are allowed to the quantum particle, but the notion of trajectory in phase space does not really apply to quantum mechanics because it wouldn't account for all this phenomenology of the double slit. So we have abandoned this and we have to sort of look at our wave function solution and trying to infer something. First of all, let's, let's go back to the allow momenta for one moment. Pi L H bar now, there is one fundamental constant of nature that is not present in classical mechanics, and it's the H bar constant. And let me remind you that H bar is something God given by nature, and by God given, I don't mean really a religious statement here. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that it's not something can be extracted from, um, from uh, any calculation has to come directly from the experiment. So if you want to remind yourself what is H bar, well, I suggest you go to my homepage, you go on the teaching, molecular physics, and you go on a convention in units again. And in the convention units, you find a coherent set of uh, values that are useful for molecular calculations that are relevant therefore for biochemistry and biophysics. And you can read off Dirac's constants. 0 0.063, I'll stop here. For me, technically this should be a four. It doesn't really matter for the sake of our, of our discussion. Kilojoule per mole per picosecond, times the picosecond. Okay, so we already had this discussion before. That anytime a constant is really not of order one already in some units where all the other units are of order one, this is already something suggesting that these effects are the, third, the effects brought in by this uh, constants are small. So let's we, remember in quantum mechanics, we can make so what, what this question is actually telling me is that, you know, I can always get finer differences in momentum between allowed states. The momentum of allowed states, you know, say I have two states with momentum N, Pn and Pm, for instance, and let's say N is greater than M for simplicity. Well then, what I have is that pi over L H bar N minus M and corresponding the kinetic energy has a finite gap, which is given by pi square of L square H bar square two M N minus M. Well, N square minus M square. So in quantum mechanics, I define a gap between allowed momentum and allowed energies. However, the magnitude of this gap is controlled by the Planck's, by the Dirac constants. 
So whenever the other physical constants here, which are provided by the system, the mass of the particle, the size of the box, they compete somehow with the Planck's constant or with the Dirac constants in order to determine whether this energy difference will be large or small in the appropriate units. Right? So when the mass of the particle grows, we see that, so when this object becomes greater and grows, then the energy quantization effects decreases. The same happens when the size of the particle grows. So typically this quantization phenomena becomes irrelevant when the size of the box becomes large or the mass of the particle becomes very heavy. I cannot touch the h-bar, right? Because h-bar uh, is a fundamental constant of nature. So, but h-bar is there to provide the reference because uh, whenever, you know, uh, the mass and, 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 and size of the systems are large and given the size of h-bar, I get a certain amount of quantization. So in other words, if I was a supernatural entity and I was able to tune h-bar at my taste, suppose, you know, I'm Odin, just not to mention, you know, godness people might believe really in real life and making distinction between everybody's beliefs. I'm just joking and bringing up some abstract divinity that we call it Odin, who was a divinity for the ancient Vikings. Just, you know, to, to keep everyone in the same pace in the atheist and the religious in the room of different religions. So let's suppose, uh, as an example, I'm a, a, a Viking god and they were right and everybody else were wrong, right? Uh, and I can change the value of h-bar at my taste. Well, if I switch h-bar and turn my h-bar knob on the left to make an h-bar smaller and smaller, then I see quantum mechanics is becoming apparent only for smaller and smaller boxes or for lighter and lighter particles. So say, let me bring in some typical numbers and see what the typical energy quantizations are for typical sizes that are relevant for molecular scales. So let's make this exercise. Let's suppose we have a molecule. Let's say the electron is confined in a system of say, say size one angstrom, that's typical atomic scale. So let's say L is 0.1 nanometers. And then the mass of the electron is about one over 2000 small than the proton mass and the proton mass is one atomic mass unit. So I can say this is one over 2000 atomic mass unit, which is the mass unit consistent with this system of units that I have uh, uh, decided to use. Then let's say I'm interested in E2 minus E1, the energy gap in a box, which is the typical size of, a, say, an atom for a typical electron. So that's a typical quantum mechanical problem, an electron in an atom, right? So I want to see how large these are. So if I bring this in, I get like pi square is roughly speaking 10, because pi is 3.13, 3 square is 9. Let's say pi square is of order 10. H bar square is six in 10 to the minus two square. So it gets 36 in 10 to the minus four, right? Then I get a nice two divided by 2000 downstairs. And I get 
L squared, that is 0.1 squared, which is 10 to the minus two. So combining things together, I get this two goes with this two. So this will be 36 times 10 is 360, so it's 3.6 times 10 to the two times 10 to the minus four divided by 10 to the minus two, which is this one, times 10 to the minus three. And this is in units of kilojoule per mole, right? So then if I combine this together, I find out that the typical energy for an electron in a box of the size of an atom has typical quantization energies, which are of order 3.6. I don't need to worry about it. I'm looking at the order of magnitude. I don't care at 0.3. So I'm looking at typical order of magnitude. And then it's 10 to the two times 10 to the five, 10 to the minus four. So that's about three in 10 to the three kilojoule per mole. So the typical quantization energy of electrons is of the order in within a system of the size of an atom are or is much larger than the typical thermal energy available in the, in the environment. I, let me remind you that typically the thermal fluctuations, the energy that is available thermal th to, by thermal fluctuations is given by KBT, Boltzmann constant times temperature and it's 300 Kelvin, that's roughly of order one in kilojoule per mole. I mean, it's not exactly one, I don't care. So really the quantization properties of electrons inside atoms are very large. So if I look at an atom and its quantization energies are large on molecular scale. So it's clearly the electrons are quantum mechanical properties the quantum mechanical properties of electrons are not something you can really neglect. Now, I want to emphasize something. We are drawing this conclusion out of a single dimensional box, infinite square well, which is certainly not a good model for an atom, right? However, what we are after is not the precise value of the energy quantization, but more or less the scale where we expect something to be quite quantum mechanical or something to be less quantum mechanical. Right. And remember, we always said at the beginning of the lecture, the transition between the classical world and the quantum world occurs more or less at the macromolecular scale. So we have seen that the electrons that are within the macromolecular scale, they are at the atomic scale, they are really are quantum mechanical. So what we are actually doing in this discussion here, let me draw, let me let me now illustrate this. Remember at the beginning of the course, very first lecture, we had like time scales and length scales here. And we were saying that, you know, the classical realm is here and the quantum realm is here. Now we haven't touched time at the moment but we can relate energy to time. Remember, energy is of the order of an inverse time scale. So this is two pi over, this is h nu, so and nu is basically one over t. So the typical time scales are h over the energy. So, you know, talking about energy quantization is basically talking about time scales for quantum mechanics is important short and time scales for large energy quantization, okay? So, so what we discovered that electrons, if you take a system of a mass of electron in a confined in a 
space of the size of an atom and within the angstrom scale. And this is entirely quantum. Now let's now take an example. Let's now take a, say a particle, just you know, for sake of comparison, of the size of a protein. And let's put it in a, let's put it in a, in a system. Let's assume the protein is, is, is confined in a cell or let's say the protein is confined in a, in, in, a, in a range of say a micron size. So let's let's go let's see how, how much quantum mechanics is needed to describe proteins and proteins remember we draw them here somehow say cells and proteins within the cell let's say, let's say we have a system of size of one micron so now what do we do we take l to be one micron which in nanometers is 10 to the 3 nanometers And now we take the mass to be all the order of the typical mass of protein. You could do that in Dalton. I've never become familiar with Daltons. Let's say there are 20, so let's say we have 100 amino acids. In each amino acid, the amino acid on average, there is about 20 atoms. And most of these atoms are nitrogen and carbon, but there are some hydrogen too. So if I were to take an average, I would say it's fair to say that on average, I would put 10 atomic units, 10 atomic mass units per amino acid. It's, it's probably more than that, but that's be conservative, which is basically two tens to the one, two, three, four, 10 to the four atomic mass units. Now, if I now look at, you know, what is the typical energy quantization and I compare it to the typical thermal energy that is available in the system because of a temperature, KBT, then, then let's see. Let's see how much it is. Uh, remember, I get pi squared, that's my 10. My H bar, remember, was 0 0.06, 0 0.06, sorry, that's 6 in 10 to the minus 2, and it becomes 36 in 10 to the minus 4, and that's uh, my 2 square minus 1, this is of order 1, and downstairs is 10 to the 3 times 2, and 10 to the 4. Now you see the situation is completely different than before because for this system of a protein confined in a region of a micrometer, we get something that the energy quantization levels in kilojoule per mole are given by 10 to the, say, let's say, I, a, I forget, I mean, 36 divided by two, it's 15. Let's suppose 15 is more or less 10, then I get, 10 to the 2 from this, this, and this. Then I have a 10 to the minus 4. And then I get 10 to the minus 3. And then again, another 10 to the minus 4 kilojoule per mole. So I get altogether 10 to the minus 9 kilojoule per mole. Now, if I have a quantum particle of a mass of a protein confined in a micrometer region, the quantization levels are nine orders of magnitude smaller than the typical thermal energy available in the system because of that thermal agitation. So clearly, this means, what does this mean? It means that if I have a, if I look at my energy, and say, this is the typical thermal agitation, which are you energy available in the system, which I will use, oh, sorry, let me put, which I will use as reference. Let me put it here, draw it here. Now, for electrons, 
we discovered then the typical quantization energy were much above that. Now, this is not a linear plot, otherwise I would have to go much further up. But let's say this is for a quantum particle that I, I mean, the single electron was like two orders of magnitude of not just a factor of two and a half, like in this case, this is zero. So quantization effects were dominant for electrons. So we have delta E over KT was roughly speaking 2000, if I remember right. Here, KT divided by KT, I'm drawing everything in units of KT now for simplicity, so this was. And now for a protein, from an object of a mass of a protein confined in a, say in a, in a, in a box of size of a micron, this was 10 to the minus nine. So yes, the, the protein in a cell sort of uh, environment is a classical object. Quantization is invisible. And it, it means that if I were to draw this quanta here, I would have to draw, to draw about 10 to the nine little bars here in order to sum them up and form an energy of the same order of the thermal energy, which means that the energy quantizations are effectively continuous for a protein in a size, in a box of size micrometer, because there are so many that there are about 10 to the ninth little coins of energy you need to make one single thermal energy. You see what I mean? So it's like if you were dividing the thermal energy, which is the typical energy exchange in, in, in an environment of temperature T in quantized coins, or rather than using cents, you're using 10 to the minus nine. So you can exchange basically any currency in a continuum region. The quanta are so small that the difference between continuum and being discrete is negligible. That's what it means to be in the classical regime. Now, let's take the case and look at the protein now and look at about, say, atoms in a protein. So now the typical size of a protein now is, say, a couple of nanometers. 10 nanometers, I would say. Well, 10 nanometers is, is the size of a swollen protein, 20 nanometers. Five nanometers, maybe it's more appropriate. One nanometer is way too small, right? So let's say we get five nanometers for a collapsed protein, but it doesn't really matter. 10 is good enough. Maybe it's a large protein, Hold on. Okay, now the mass, so L is about 10 nanometers. The mass of atoms, we said used before the units, 10 atomic mass units, 10 proton per atom, 10 nucleon per atom, maybe it's 20 is more appropriate. Let's say 20 atomic mass units, including proton, including about well, 10 makes calculations simpler. It really doesn't matter. We are after energy scales, not about any precise value. So if you have this, now we can compute the same thing and see if this is of order one in units of KT or not. So again, I need to look at pi square, h bar square divided by two m l square. So I get my usual factor 10 for pi square. I get my usual factor 36 times 10 to the minus four from h bar square. But now I get two times 20, and this is 100. So you see now we get something quite interesting because I have 360 divided by 100, collecting this and this, and then divided by two, let's say this guy here, all together, let me say 
I messed up. So let me do things more carefully. So I got my factor 10, I got my factor 616 10 to the minus 4, I get my 100 here from this, and I get by 2 times uh, 10. So this 10 goes with this 10, this 100 goes with 3 here, and that, that's of the order 10 to the minus 4. So what is this telling me? that overall the conformation dynamics of atomic nuclei in a proton, in a protein is classical, all right? Because if my particle moves basically by as much space as the protein size is allowing it to move, my atoms can move say from stretched protein configuration to small say, compact configurations, it will fluctuate by roughly 10 nanometers. And the mass of the pro of the atom is fixed by the amount of protons and neutrons in it, basically. And what we're discovering is typical energy quantization are 10,000 times smaller than the typical thermal energy, which means that with an accuracy of one part time per 10 thousandths, uh, we can consider energy quantization effects to be small, compare to uh, compare to the uh, size of uh, the typical energy quantity. So that is what I was referring to when I said the part of the dynamics of proteins is, is really classical. Remember I told you pro uh, nature in the very first lecture, nature chose to operate through the smallest possible classical scale. The conformational dynamics of macromolecules is in fact something that occurs at the Is it some, it's something that occurs typically at the classical scale. So I can make simulation of macromolecular system, assuming that atoms behave like Newtonian's particle and solve Hamilton's equation or Newton's equations. That's an incredible piece of simplification. Nature operates through nanomachines that are active at the last classical scale, okay? Is it always true? Well, you know, is it everything there is inside protein classical? Well, already, well, let's go piecewise. We know that some properties of proteins are not classical because the force that atom experience are due to the electrostatic charge that surrounds them and the formation of hydrogen bonds and whatnot. And these are due to the electronic properties. And now if I look at how the electrons are actually distributed in atoms, this is a quantum mechanical property. So this is what I was referring that in order to understand proteins that leave the conformational dynamics leaves at the last classical scale, you need some information from quantum mechanics. In particular, you must use quantum mechanics to understand the electronic structure because the electrons are not classical particles and you need quantum mechanics to get the electrons. And the electrons are responsible for the electrostatic forces and that, that, that keep the protein together and are responsible for the forces that each atom experiences and determines the motion of this atom. But the motion of the atoms by themselves is basically a classical motion. Now, is it always classical? Well, you know, so far to determine the classical nature of the, of the atoms, we look at the slowest possible motion that is the conformational dynamics of new, uh, atomics nuclei in a protein that is evolving and changing shape over a scale of uh, say 10 nanometers. Now there is however, other type of uh, dynamics 
that is much more short and fast, and it's the vibrational dynamics of chemical bonds. That's the fastest nuclear motion you can get in a cell. You know, the Raman spectroscopy, you know that. Basically, nuclei, you have a chemical bond, say, I don't know, the simplest case is, of course, the water molecule. And the hydrogen and, and, and oxygen atoms are on a typical fixed distance, but this distance is actually not really held still, but can fluctuate. And that's because in a classical picture, because the hydrogen and, and, and oxygen can vibrate, and of course, in quantum mechanics, you have to use the concept of wave function. So the idea is, do we expect the energy of this to be typically large or small quantization energy compared to the thermal energy? So let's estimate. We know the typical vibrations between atomic bonds are in the frequency of inverse picoseconds. So all we need to do is to multiply h bar times this frequency. And if you do that, you basically have to multiply by two par h bar. So the a Planck's constant is, is Dirac's constant by two pi times the frequency, which is basically 10 times the Planck's constant. Planck's constant was 0 0.06, that's roughly speaking 0 0.7, 0 0.8 picosecond minus one kilojoule per mole. So yeah, we are getting the 1.5 kilojoule per mole is the typical thermal energy, right? So this vibration energy are actually rather quantum mechanical. So the, the chemical bonding is still an effect that is basically quantum mechanics. But the large conformation of dynamics is basically possible. So we came to this conclusion that quantum, that, that if I look at macromolecules, if I draw them, say again, I use a protein as a prototype, and I draw the classical to quantum rayon, well, I could draw quantum macromolecules, so to, so to say, in this way. There is a little bit of dynamics in quantum in macromolecules that is quantum, that is the vibrational dynamics of chemical bond. But the conformational dynamics, the one that is responsible for large allosteric transition, protein folding, regulation, is entirely classical. However, you need quantum mechanics to get the forces. So this is how the picture looks like in terms of how much quantum mechanics do we need to understand macromolecules. See how much information was dig out from a simple hydrogen atom, sorry, from a simple square well problem. And that's, uh, that's quite impressive, right? So it was actually a simple problem that carried out information that was sufficient to analyze the order of magnitude of basically anything by just looking at the scale of masses and H bar compared to a typical scale that I'm interested in that process. For macropolitical in solutions, what I'm interested in comparing is the typical quantization energy with the typical thermal energy, because if my quantization energy are much smaller than the thermal energy, it means that basically these effects can be considered as a continuum. Now, for for, for vibrational dynamics, this is not really true. There is some quantum effect there. However, we are not really interested in that effect because all we are really interested in understanding is, is how proteins change shape. So basically what you can do is to keep that distance fixed and just forget about that physics and look at the other physics. Or even if you allow this distance to vary, you're never gonna be trusting the predictions about this quantization vibrations. If you wanted to compute say uh, something related to experiments, you might gonna need quantum mechanics. However, if you're not interested in that because you're interested in biophysics and biology, uh, you don't have to worry about it.
that. And you can use quantum mechanical, classical models for studying proteins as long as the force comes from quantum mechanics. So that's the end of this lecture. And in the next lecture, we're gonna to touch briefly on multidimensional generalization of the Bible of the infinite world problem, and then move all forward towards building more information in quantum.